Okay, you're wanting to become a junior developer and you're wondering what you need to know. As it happens, I've known a few before you from my interviews on the Scrimba podcast, and I'm sure you'll join them in their success soon enough. To help you get there sooner rather than later, I'm here to present to you five things you should know if you want to become a junior developer efficiently. Let's get into it. A very effective guiding principle or hack is to orientate your learning around projects. Because if you follow that principle, you will sidestep a lot of potential pitfalls that junior developers fall into. Primarily, we get in the habit of following tutorials, and then when we have a custom problem to solve, we effectively Google the tutorial, but it doesn't exist. This is what we call tutorial hell, and we want to avoid it at all costs. By building projects, you're more likely to understand programming methodology, programming logic, and some more underlying concepts. Then, when you're presented with a custom problem, you have a better idea about what building blocks you need, and you start searching how to glue them together instead of for a complete solution, exactly like you might have to as a freelancer or in a full-time junior developer role. If maybe you're struggling for project ideas, check out this video where I talk about 10 plus front-end project ideas. But to be honest, you can start very simple with custom calculators, and you can even expand upon tutorial projects if you want to. That's a great place to start. But what I would would like to see is you progress towards solving your own creative problems with code. It's hard, but one thing we can all learn from the book Make It Stick is that learning is more effective, you remember more, you understand better when learning is effortful. And it's worth the effort because employers love to hear about custom projects and see how you've used your coding skills creatively and that you finished a project to completion. And if you're looking for an educational resource orientated around this idea of project-based learning, look no further than the front-end developer career path here at Scrimba. This path is comprised of 12 interactive modules in which you're encouraged to click the video. Yes, you can click the video and select copy, edit, and even run your own code. It's a revolutionary format, which our teachers take full advantage of to encourage you to get your hands on the keyboard and solving your own problems in order to sidestep tutorial hell. Instead of trying to learn several technologies, I highly encourage you to pick one programming language and maybe a complementary library or framework and stick to it. It's tough nowadays because web and programming is so fast. You can do mobile development, you can do web development and various things in between. And when we talk about web development, we choose between different languages and frameworks like React, Angular, Vue, Ember, the list goes on and on. But let me remind you, an if statement in JavaScript is the same as an if statement in Java and is the same as an if statement in C++. My comparison will fall down the deeper you go in these languages and their specialities, but the fact remains that even though it doesn't seem like this when you're new, the specific languages and tools you use are fairly inconsequential as long as you're learning the programming methodologies and how to think like a programmer, because that's what takes the most time and it's the thing that transfers most easily to other technologies as you progress for your career or find new opportunities. You don't have to take this advice. I don't think you should take any advice blindly. For example, say you're learning JavaScript and React, and then you learn that in your particular country or city, there are far more jobs with JavaScript and Vue.js, for example. I think that's a pretty good reason to change and learn a different framework, but try not to sway with the wind because you'll end up spinning your wheels and not really getting anywhere. Okay, feedback loops. It sounds a bit abstract, but according to HubSpot, a feedback loop is a process in which the outputs of a system are circled back and used as inputs. Ugh. I think I'm just trying to sound smarter than I am. Let's just rename this whole section to seek feedback. Sure, you can code in a corner and save all your files to your solid state drive, I suppose, nowadays, but you should ideally share your code on GitHub, for example, where you expose it to the world and you have an opportunity to be seen. Let me get a bit more specific though, because we like to share actionable, tangible advice here at Scrimba. Imagine you share your code every day with the 100 days of code hashtag. At first, it will feel like you're shouting into the void. Some bots will like your posts, but over time, maybe after a week or two, you'll start to recognize some familiar people commenting and liking your posts. This is encouraging, yes, but it might also lead to feedback. 
Then when you're deciding what feature to add next or where to improve, you'll be able to take that feedback and make it part of your next decision, hence a feedback loop. Here's another example. Imagine you do contribute to another GitHub project, slightly more advanced thing by the way, so don't feel intimidated if you're not ready yet. And say you do the contribution and you learn that you got the pull request totally wrong. Maybe you forgot to use a template or your etiquette was bad. It hurts, it sucks, it stings, but you learn. And then next time you make a contribution, you know what to improve next, right? It's a feedback loop. Say you're pair programming on a project, you do something inefficiently and your coding buddy shows you how to improve. Next time you're writing that kind of code, you will take on board the feedback. Bringing this a bit closer to people who are ready to apply to jobs, say you apply to a bunch of jobs and you get loads of calls from recruiters, these 10, 15 minute screening calls, but you never get any interview calendar invitations. Well, from that, you can maybe discern that your resume does not accurately reflect your skills or you're applying to the wrong jobs. Maybe you have a fantastic credential or credentials, but you just keep bombing the phone interview and that's why you don't get the call back. You take that on board and when you next sort of make your next application or whatever, you take all that on board to make that decision. The output is becoming part of your next input, right? These are quite harsh examples, but I do think it's important to highlight that you can't improve something you don't know about. The only way to learn what you do and don't know about is to sort of get going, even though it can be scary at first. This section is quite heavily inspired by a book called Show Your Work by Austin Kleon. In that book, the author goes on to say that you don't need a finished product to show the world. You can share something small every day, for example, doing the 100 days of code hashtag. Why? Because this is how you become part of the community, by sharing your thoughts, interacting, and getting feedback. Another idea is to teach what you know, because even though you might feel like you need to be an expert to teach, it's not true at all. You shouldn't assume that because you know something is obvious to other people because you don't know what they know, essentially. And likewise, you might say there's a lot of resources on this subject already, but you were just there a few days or a few weeks ago, maybe struggling a bit, which means that tutorial did not perfectly suit your problem. Maybe they could have phrased something differently, used more examples. Maybe they went off on a tangent which you could address. Maybe the medium didn't work for you. Maybe it was an article, but you learned best visually via videos and so forth. These are all opportunities to create something better. I'm not saying it will trend and become viral or anything like that, but I should add that these are the exact same things, whether it's participation in a community or content, that employers can look at to see a sort of history of where you've been, where you are and where you're going, kind of proving that this isn't just a hobby to you and something you've picked up, but clearly something about which you're passionate. I'm a self-taught developer and I'm assuming you probably are too. I strongly feel like a lot of the educational materials that students pay a lot for at university are available for free or very inexpensively online. What we tend to miss as self-taught devs, and maybe some comp sci students miss out on this too, is the social part. Friends, parties, sure, but once that sort of initial hype dies down, what you're left with is people who have the same motivation as you. It's very useful to be around smart people who think like you or have a similar destination because you will be exposed to new ideas, opportunities. You might also get an opportunity to benchmark yourself. I don't think there's an absolute measure of a developer, but you might see places in which you have natural strengths or maybe natural weaknesses. In other words, places to avoid or at least optimize for the future. A lot of software is about collaboration and soft skills and if you've never had a job before or you've never worked in IT or any sort of uh, knowledge worker type role it can be hard to know where your weaknesses lie. I think getting involved in community, contributing to GitHub and so on is a great way to make friends and it's a substitute for the kind of thing that a competitive computer science graduate with whom you might be competing with for a junior developer role will be bringing to the table. This kind of begs the question, like, where do you make new friends? Well, I highly recommend Twitter, following some accounts, getting involved in the conversation. Don't worry about likes and followers and stuff. Think about the connection. But fortunately for you, there are many Discord communities nowadays. For one thing, you'd be incredibly welcome in the Scrimber Discord community. It's not just for our students. Everybody is welcome. But you don't really have to pledge loyalty to any one server. For example, Eddie, a friend of ours at Scrimber who's been on the Scrimber podcast with me, they have a community dedicated to finding and contributing to open source projects and it's very supportive. So if that's your goal, maybe that's where you go to hang out. Another friend of ours, Francesco, has a content creation community. So say you're looking for a better way to showcase your work, to draw attention from employers or whatever, and you're wanting some support, that's a great place to go. And I have to say that tech Twitter and our community in general at Scrimber and the wider web development community could not be more welcome so please get involved. It will help you massively on your journey to becoming a self-taught developer. 
Well, there you have it. Those are five things you need to know if you want to become a junior web developer in 2022. I'm glad we could touch on a few different topics from some practical skills, as well as some soft skills and the networking and creative part of it. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, please do remember to subscribe to the Screenbird YouTube channel. You can also check out some other recommended videos here on your screen.